Right before we jump into this video, if you have camera gear, I want to ask you how do you organize and protect it? Well, I created a free app called My Gear Vault that you can download right now for iOS and Android at mygearvault.com. Jared Poland, Frono's Photo. Dot com here on the campus of St. Joseph's University to test out the Nikon D7500 at the Philadelphia Freedoms tennis match. Now, what lenses did I bring out to use today? I'm bringing everything from kit lenses to the higher end Nikon lenses because I know a lot of people want to see how will this camera work with kit lenses, but also how will it work with the higher end glass, especially being that we're shooting in a stadium that doesn't have the best lights. So let's head on in and take some photos. The first thing that we photographed was Dave Leno interviewing Billie Jean King. Now that was really awesome to be in the same room as such a powerful figure in American history and also in women's sports and women's rights. She is incredible. Now when I was taking photos, I switched between the 70 to 200 Nikon and the 18 to 400 Tamron. Now when I tried to use the 18 to 400 Tamron, man oh man did I have to bump that ISO and it looked like those images weren't as sharp because it's a super zoom lens. This camera sporting a 20.9 megapixel DX sensor, which means that it is a crop sensor that any lens you put on it, you multiply by 1.5x to get the 35 millimeter equivalent. Now the sensor that's in this camera is the same that you will find in the Nikon D500, but comparing it to the D7200, which is its predecessor, that one had about four megapixels more. Now, do I think that this is a big deal? Honestly, no. You don't need those extra megapixels, especially being that this camera has an Xpeed 5 processor and that 20.9 megapixel sensor, which is great inside of that D500, which I think means it's gonna be great inside of this one as well. And on top of that, there is no OLPF, which means you should get sharper images. The ISO range that you have is 100 to 51,200, that's native. Now how high can it go? It can go up to 1.6 million if you really wanted to push it. Now what's that gonna look like? It's probably gonna look like Swiss cheese, so if you go far, I probably wouldn't go beyond the recommended 51,200. The D7500 is 5% lighter than the D7200 because it uses carbon fiber. Now, one of the things that you'll also find with this camera, it is completely weather sealed, which is not something you find in some of the lower end cameras that manufacturers make. So that is a plus. Nikon has added a 3.2 inch tilting touchscreen. Now it's less resolution than the predecessor, which is stupid. Why would Nikon do that? I don't know. Maybe it has something to do with the touchscreen and the ability to tilt it. Now, one thing I noticed when trying to shoot with the touchscreen, holding it above my head and tilting it, it didn't tilt all the way down like the Nikon D750 did. Why did they do this? I don't know, but it does make shooting over your head more difficult because you can't tilt the screen flat like this. Now the lighting situation was kind of odd. We had windows behind the subjects, we had windows behind me, which pretty much is a quick tip that if there's windows, have them at your back filling in your subject's light, which should help you get better results. In this situation, I didn't have to bump the ISO terribly too far because this camera can handle it in most situations where I was shooting it, but also when I put on those kit lenses, I had to bump the ISO to compensate for the loss of light. One of the main differences between this and the D500 is that this camera has a pop-up flash. So if you get stuck somewhere and you need to get some extra light, pop up that flash and take some photos. I started 
enough shooting behind the baseline, which with the 70 to 200 lens acting as a 100 to 300, gave me a pretty nice reach, but it didn't fill the frame as much as I wanted when I was trying to shoot the opposite baseline. So I also switched around to use the 300 F4, which gave me the equivalent of a 450 millimeter lens. I then moved to center court because there I could get a nice V angle to the subject over here and another V angle to the subject over there, which gave me a nice opportunity to get cleaner shots without the net in the way. The camera shoots at eight frames a second, which is getting up there to some of the early DSLRs that were much more expensive. Eight frames a second is a lot. One of the things I noticed when shooting rapid succession photos is that it didn't feel like I was getting eight frames a second. Now, part of the reason is this was a darker arena that I was shooting in, and I had the camera set to only release when something was actually in focus. So when I was doing continuous focus of the subject going forward or left to right, I wasn't getting full eight frames a second because the focus had to catch up before it would snap the photo. Now you need to keep this in mind when you are shooting with the kit lenses that have variable apertures, meaning they go from 3.5 to say 6.3, you need to bump that ISO to compensate for the light that you're losing. So that means you're gonna see more noise and grain introduced when you use those kit lenses. So I also moved behind the baseline, but there were risers set up, so I was up a little higher, which gave me a great opportunity to break out that 300 F4 because I was shooting down on this angle, which means the net wasn't in the way as much, and I got some awesome shots from there. So keep in mind, by changing your level, you're gonna change up the type of images you're gonna capture. What type of images am I looking for when I'm shooting tennis? Now, I'm looking for those tight shots at first that get the action in there, it gets the follow through, it gets the ball somewhere near the racket, or in certain cases, it's the follow through and the ball is out of focus coming back towards the camera. Those are the shots that are winners when it comes to sports photos. Here's a basic quick tip. When the players are about to play, you better not be moving and you better not be a distraction because somebody will yell at you and say, hey, hairball, stop moving. There are 51 autofocus points in this camera and 15 of them are cross type. Now, one thing you have to keep in mind is that they do not go edge to edge in this camera, which is kind of odd when you're shooting with a DX camera because the Nikon D500 has the focusing points edge to edge, which makes it easier to put those points where you want them. But 51 autofocusing points are great. 15 cross type, I would prefer that all of them are cross type. Maybe in the future they will do that. But in my experience shooting tennis, I didn't miss very often and I was shooting in the 21 point continuous AF and I think it did a really nice job. Let me jump in here real quick and ask you, do you shoot raw? Well, if you do, head on over to store.fronosphoto.com to pick up your I Shoot Raw shirts right now. One of the biggest complaints you'll get from me and a lot of people out there who were looking at this camera seriously is that it has one SD card slot that is UHS-1, which means it's a slower card slot for transferring data. But the bigger deal is the fact that they got rid of the two SD card slots. I am a big fan of having two slots so that I can shoot redundant, shoot raw files to one and shoot raw files to the other just in case something ever happens with the SD card. Now, it's not a complete deal breaker. It's just a major annoyance that Nikon went ahead and got rid of that SD card, that extra SD card slot. So let's talk about some video specs. This camera does shoot 4K UHD up to 30 frames a second. It also does 1080 at 60 frames a second, but keep in mind, with the 4K, it has a 1.5X crop factor. Now that's already on top of the 1.5X crop factor. Now how does it look? Well, you tell me, because you're looking at video straight off this camera. If you're wondering how will the autofocus be during video recording, it's going to be 
okay. It's not gonna be the best of the best in the industry. If you're looking for a camera that does the best of the best in the industry autofocus while shooting video, you might wanna check out Canon and their dual pixel AF. So I had some opportunities to use the 10 to 20 DX lens, which is only $309, but it came in handy to get those ultra wide angle shots that I wanted to get where it showed Philadelphia freedom or just freedom on the court, but showed the entire stands and the lights up above and the players on the court. It really did a nice job for allowing me to get those wider shots on a DX sensor. Now, if you're wondering what is the stabilization for video inside this camera, it's a three axis digital image stabilization. It should do an okay job, but it's no replacement for a real VR lens. But keep in mind, it's only available if you're shooting in 1080p, not 4K. That ball was clearly out. Now they're arguing, look, they're arguing. This camera's priced at $1246.95 for body only, but you can get a kit lens, the 18 to 140, for roughly $200 more. Now I spotted something interesting in this camera that some of the other Nikon cameras don't have, and that's the ability to add format card to your My Menu. Now that's something you don't find in all of the other cameras, but it's something I like using to quickly be able to get to formatting. Now, the reason they didn't put it there in the past is they don't want people to easily find the format because they don't want them reformatting a card before they save the images. Right before we wrapped up the shoot, I realized I didn't go all the way upstairs straight behind the baseline. And when I went up there, put the 300 F4 on, I got one of the best shots of the day, if not the best shot, which is the player fully stretched out with the ball coming off the racket. It's an awesome edge to edge shot with no cropping. Now it has the up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right D-pad, but a joystick above that would put your thumb in the right position to be able to change your focusing points much easier. Now that's something you start to find in the Nikon D500 and above cameras. Oh, this is where I would love to have a vertical grip. If you're somebody who shoots a lot of vertical images or needs extra battery power, there's something missing with this camera and that is the vertical grip. Nikon will not be making a grip to go on this camera, which means it's much more difficult to shoot vertical because you have to turn your hand over the top and then you have to try and move the focusing points, which becomes more difficult. And also, if you wanna have two batteries operating, you have one in the camera and one in the grip, well, you don't have that option now. Why did Nikon do this? I can't tell you. Maybe there will be a third-party grip, but I don't recommend third-party grips. So the match just ended and I had a little bit of time to review some of the images on the back of the camera. And from what I saw, it looks like the camera did a very good job at higher ISOs, as well as hitting focus for the most part. But the only way to determine how the camera worked and how the files looked is to get them back into the computer and process those raw files. So let's head back to the loft. So here we are back at the loft to take a look at the images to see how they turned out. But I wanna remind you that you can head over to the website to download the full res exported JPEGs as well as sample raw files so that you could pixel peep them yourself. So let's take a look at some of the images. So here is the first image and it so happens to be of Sloan Stevens who just won the US Open. Now this was taken at 1250 ISO because it was a darker room with the 70 to 200 and everything looks perfectly fine uh, to me right here. Now moving on, Billie Jean King. Having Billie Jean King in the same room, she is a force to be reckoned with. And the color, I bumped up just a little bit, the color in her glasses in post, uh, it looks like I'm not super tack on the eyes, but part of the reasons for that, oh, there's multiple reasons now that I look at what I shot it with. One, I'm at 3200 ISO. Two, I'm shooting through glasses, which sometimes takes away some of the quality of the sharpness. And three, I'm using the 18 to 400 
Tamron, all right? We're at 185 millimeters, and you look in close, you can see some of the noise, you can see some of the grain, and that's something to remember, is that when you use those 18 to 400s, or those expanded lenses that have variable aperture ranges, is that when you zoom out, to compensate, you have to bump your ISO, which causes you to lose quality. And a lot of people think that the noise that you're getting is the camera's fault, when in essence, it's the lens choice that you're using. So remember that, this, this camera is positioned in a place that it could be used, you know, you could do jobs with it, you could do jobs with any camera, but it's more of an amateur end camera that many people may find that they think that the camera sucks, but it's not really the camera, it's that the settings aren't right, or that the lens choices just aren't right. So keep that in mind when you're looking at it. But even at 3200, from a distance, it's perfectly fine. When you zoom in one-to-one -one in pixel peep, yeah, there's a little bit going on in here, but really, it's not that bad in terms of ISO. So let's keep moving on to the next one. I just like this shot, switched back over to the 70 to 200, dropped my ISO just a little bit, and Billie Jean just looks really serious here. But I did show you the one before because she was really happy. It just is a serious look that she was given, but I like this shot right here. Now moving on to the match. Can you shoot action shots with this type of camera? And the answer is, Absolutely yes, if you get your settings right. One one thousandth of a second at 2.8 at ISO 2500 is pushing the crop sensor camera a, a pretty fair amount, but I think it handled itself very well for a shot like this. Yes, you can see the grain inside of her face, but remember, that's one to one when you're zoomed in like that. When we go back to the first image, I just go back to this for a reason, when you zoom in, when you fill the frame more, you're not gonna see the noise be as pronounced because you're filling the frame more with that shot. Let me jump in here real quick and say, do you wanna take better pictures in only 11 days? Well, I created a free mini video course that you can sign up for for free right now at fronosphoto.com slash 11 days. So let's move on to something that I noticed uh, here. I broke out, what is this lens? This is the 10 to 20 Nikon lens. It's 310 bucks, it's really plasticky, but if you need an ultra wide lens for pretty darn cheap, it's gonna do a pretty okay job. Just know that it weighs almost nothing. Now I picked this out because I didn't have the flicker control on. You can see right here, look at these people right here sitting in the pink with the pink shirts. We go from one image to the next, you can see that they're dark there. That's all from the flicker of the lights. But when I turned on the anti-flicker inside of the camera, what's happening is that the camera will not shoot when a flick is happening. It will only shoot on the er, not the flick, but on the er, or on the flick or the er. It's whichever way you want it to be. But just remember that, that anti-flicker is great because the camera won't shoot if it detects that it's gonna get that flicker. And as soon as I turned that on, no more flickered images, and they all were consistent from that point on under that lighting situation that I was in. Then when you're shooting tennis, you want to change up your angles. I talked about this before, and I was going for this type of shot. And luckily for me, his thumb isn't fully cut off on the side right here. But yes, the, now we're at 6400 ISO. I'm at F4 with the 300 millimeter. When you zoom in, yes, you can see some noise. But if I was to print this out at a 20 by 30 or larger, you're really not gonna see much of an issue. So remember that, don't always focus on the pixel peeping aspect, focus in on capturing the moment and getting the picture right. And in this case, really like this shot. Um, moving on, just wanted to show you some good action that was captured. 5,000 ISO, just pushing the camera a little further to see how it does, and I think it has. I think it did very well. Again, super low light situation in here. It wasn't the most lit area for a venue that I've ever been in because it's a little older uh, and pretty dark, and unlike hockey, you don't have white ice to reflect light back up. So in this situation, you gotta bump that ISO to get a faster shutter speed to freeze that action, which means you're gonna introduce just a little bit of some noise and some grain, but I think it's pretty much okay. 8,000 ISO, 300 millimeter, good shot, filling the frame, not cropped, looks good. Now I picked this one out because 18 to 400 millimeter lens, it's at f6.3 now that we're zoomed out, and just know that the people in the background, they're not blurring out. That's why those more expensive f2.8 lenses are there, and you see those on the sidelines at sports, because they will totally obliterate the background, but leave your subject nice and isolated. But for the money, when you use one of those larger zoom lenses, obviously 
when it's $400 or $500 compared to $3,000, there's a big difference. And doing this type of shot is just showing you that yes, you can even do it with an 18 to 400 Tamron lens if you get your settings right. Um, in terms of focus speed, the camera did fine all day tracking the subjects, even with the lower end Tamron lens on it. So I still nailed it here, 8,000 ISO. We are getting that noise, we are getting that grain. I don't worry about that because I got the shot right and that's what I care about. And then moving on, another cool shot. I just like this one because he just served it in the background and the guy's getting ready for what looks to be a backhand return back to this guy back here. But then look at this guy, he's all like, ooh, I'm super intense. That's because it's at f6.3, and you pretty much can see the guy. Same thing, now we're at 220 millimeters, pushing it to 10,000 ISO to see how far we can really push it. And yeah, now you're starting to get a little bit mushy with that DX sensor. And yes, I could drop my shutter speed slower, but then I run the, run the risk of an out of focus image, which this one doesn't really look tack sharp anywhere. Um, Maybe down here. Yeah, the feet are fine and he's off the ground. So 10,000 ISO, sort of usable if you needed to put it online. And then just wanted to show you the difference of what happens when you put on a 70 to 202.8. It's much cleaner. You can drop the ISO to 4,000 instead of at 10,000. Uh, and it looks a heck of a lot better. Uh, but of course, that's something that you can grow into. I don't expect everybody who's getting this camera to have the best pieces of glasses, but at some point, you can aspire to have better glass as you transition in your photography career. Um, super low angle, threw that 10 to 20 lens back on there to get a wide shot of everything. 4,000 ISO, just like this shot, really looks good. Same thing from the other side of the court, freezing the action of this girl, returning the serve. Uh, you can see the ball in there. You can see everybody on the court. Where's the other guy, uh, girl hiding? She's all the way back there. So everything pretty much in focus here, front to back, because it's ultra wide angle at 10 millimeters. But this lens came in handy, and for 310 bucks, it gave me that extra oomph that I wanted to get those wide angle shots. Um, now I went super high up into the rafters shooting with the 300 millimeter because with the DX camera that gave me 450 millimeter equivalent and 4,000 ISO, great action. Look, 4,000 ISO, some people think that, that that's extreme and you should never go there. I think with this camera from what we've seen, if you shot at 6,400 ISO and you shot the action stuff, you could have gotten away with it all day long. As long as you nailed your exposure and got your focus tack sharp, you would have been fine. In this case, uh, the, the 4,000 ISO at f4 is perfectly fine as well. Love that shot, love the, the emotion right here. And then we wrap it up with this backhand return on a serve that's not cropped, fully outstretched, love this tennis shot right here. Just really love the action that was captured here. Now, when you're doing the sports like this, you get your settings and you basically lock them in and you shoot so you can focus in on shooting. But the big question is, is who's this camera for and is it worth it? If you're just starting out, this is a very good camera to start with. It's not as expensive as the Nikon D500, but it's also not as inexpensive as the D5600, but it offers a lot of frames per second. If I was just starting out, like many years ago when I started at 13, I had three frames a second. This camera gives you a lot more. It gives you eight frames a second for a pretty good value. That's a lot of frames a second. But one of the downsides is still the fact that Nikon got rid of the extra memory card slot. I'm still a big fan of having multiple card slots. Just in case something happens to card one, I still have card two. So if that is something that you can't live with, then you may need to upgrade to a higher end Nikon because even on the Canon side in the equivalent type camera, that only has one card as well. So if you need two cards, you're gonna have to spend more money and get something like the D500. But all around, being able to shoot in this low light situation, have great autofocus, have a lot of frames per second, getting nice quality, I'm very happy with the results that I got with this camera. So yes, I can recommend this. But above everything else, I always need to remind you that it's you who makes the camera even better. If you understand the exposure triangle and what you're doing and you put quality glass on there, or even if you put something like an 18 to 400 Tamron on there, you still can get get great results if you know how to control the camera and don't let the camera control you. 
So as always, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to download the sample raw files over on the site. Don't forget to hit subscribe, share, like, comment, all of those good things. And that's where I'll leave it. Jared Poland, froknowsphoto.com. See ya.